Hello, I'm Richard Peters, a wildlife photographer from the UK. And throughout my entire career, I've always used Nikon kit in my creative process. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the cameras that I've used, the lenses I've used, and show you some of the photos that I've taken. I try to keep my camera bag as simple as possible. So for almost any shoot I go on, that's two lenses and two bodies, and usually two bodies the same as well, so that it takes away any um, opportunity to think, oh, should I use the crop sensor? Should I use the faster camera? I just try to shoot with two bodies the same, super simple, two lenses, and that's it. And I tend to only upgrade kit when um, I reach limit of what I'm using. So if the kit's starting to slow me down in some way, shape or form over the years, um, that's when I'll upgrade the kit. So rather than just buying something because it's new and shiny, I'll buy it because there's an actual purpose, there's an, there's an actual reason for the upgrade. Um, and at the moment, my latest acquisition is the Nikon Z9, and it's my first real mirrorless camera, actually. And it's brilliant. It's enabling me to get photos already that I couldn't take with any other camera. It, it was an upgrade because I could see the value in it and I could see the worth in it. And that's the best time to change your camera kit over. My very first ever DSLR was the Mighty D100. And looking at it now, it's actually quite funny because it just looks so old, so ancient. The screen on the back is tiny. I mean, the screen's horrendous, actually. It's so small. But it was an amazing camera at the time. It was one of the only DSLRs available. And for then, it was phenomenal. I was using one of these. I was using a 70 to 300 um, variable aperture lens. So nothing fancy whatsoever, but I loved it because it was my first proper camera and I just enjoyed playing around with it and just experimenting. And that's what it's all about at the beginning. It's just having a camera, having fun and uh, seeing where you go with it. My first ever full big body camera was the D2X. And the thing that was special about this is it had a high speed crop mode that allowed you to take a smaller image. So it went from 12 megapixels down to six megapixels, but that increased the frame rate. And I used this camera to take my first ever kind of successful photo, which was called Spring Lamb. Not technically a wild animal, more of a farmyard animal, but it was the first picture I ever took that had some recognition. So I owe quite a lot to this camera for that photo. But the first real big leap for me was when I got the D3. Now this was a phenomenal camera because this took low level light shooting and high ISOs to a whole new level that the industry hadn't seen before. Back in the day, this camera really did change the industry um, and it really forced everybody to up their game. So really fond memories of this camera and even holding it now, it's just, it's got such a nice feel to it. It's just one of those cameras that, that when you pick it up, everything feels right. So after the D3, the camera that really stands out for me is the D850. So I used those big body cameras uh, up until uh, the D800. And when the D800 came out with its uh, huge megapixel sensor, although it was a lot slower, and so the big body cameras were fast, I really liked the image quality and the dynamic range of those big sensors. And so I switched over and I didn't look back. So the D800 was great, the D810 was phenomenal. The D850 just combined high megapixels and high speed all in one amazing package. And so this was the camera that I used for five years, really. It was absolutely phenomenal. Love this camera. The two lenses I use for almost every shoot I do are the 400 2.8, which is one of my favorite lenses ever, and a 70 to 200. The 400 2.8 is my favorite lens of all time. I absolutely love it. If I was gonna only take one lens anywhere, it would be this one without a doubt. I absolutely love it. Um, it's a big jump um, up to a 400 2.8, but I made that journey uh, in, in small steps. So I started with a 70 to 300, which was a very small fixed variable aperture lens. I made a big upgrade to a 200 to 400, um, and then that eventually was an upgrade to a 600. And then I went from 600 back down focal length wise to a 400. And the reason I went back down is because it's just a smaller lens, it's a lighter lens, it's easy to get into a bag for hand luggage when you're on a flight. And that's a really important thing because I don't want to lose sight of this. So 400, 2.8 and a 70 to 200 are the two lenses that get me through virtually everything I shoot. We've looked at some of the kits that I use. Now let's have a look at some of the images that I've taken that really resonate with me and uh, I'll talk a bit about why they do. So the first image is Snow Pounce. And the thing I love about this photo is it breaks all the rules. So you've got a fox 
jumping out of the frame so you can't see the whole subject. The negative space is technically on the wrong side according to the rules of photography. Um, but that's what I love about it. Rules are meant to be broken and this image completely encapsulates that. And I nearly deleted this photo when I took it because of those reasons. I thought, well, the subject's not completely in the frame. It's on the wrong side of the frame. It's not a successful photo. Nearly deleted it, decided not to, waited a year, looked back at it, thought it was pretty good actually, entered it into Wildlife Photographer of the Year and it was awarded. So it just goes to show you that the photos you maybe at first think are bad aren't always quite as bad as you think. The next image we're gonna look at is Shadow Walker. And this is one of my more successful photos. And the thing I love about this image is it was taken in my garden at home and it's of an urban fox. So it's nothing exotic and it's not an exotic location. So you don't have to travel the world to take photos of animals and unique images. Just a little bit of thought, a little bit of perseverance, dedicate some time to photographing something over and over. The more you photograph it, the better your pictures are gonna become. And this image was part of a project I did in the garden for a year, just concentrating on photographing the animals that would visit at night. And it was taken with a camera trap and a wide angle lens. Again, I've used all the wide angle lenses in the range, but this was taken with the 18 to 35. So not even a high uh, specification lens. But for this type of photography, you don't need it. So it's absolutely perfect. Next, we're gonna look at Beautiful Chaos. Now, this is an image of a pigeon in flight, and it's actually coming into land on my bird table, again, in the garden. And I like to show pictures taken in the garden because it's just so important to realize you don't have to hop on a plane. You don't have to travel the world. You really can take good photos anywhere there's wildlife and with any kit as well. So, you know, don't get bogged down in seeing all these amazing portfolios of photographers everywhere. Don't compare yourself to them. Pick a subject, something local to home, even a squirrel, even a pigeon, and just concentrate on trying to get a good collection of images of that subject and you really will get there in the end. And here I've just used a slow shutter speed with a pop of flash at the end just to freeze the motion of the bird. So you've got these wings that are all over the place, creating these nice shapes in the sky and then freezing the subject at the end with that little pop of the flash. The light is the most important thing and this image really, really uh, speaks volumes to that. Another great example of using light is with this photo of a puffin. For me, I think the more you photograph the same subject, the less you photograph the subject, but the better the pictures become because you know what you've taken before and so you don't just wanna keep repeating the same photos over and over. So whenever I go to photograph puffins, I'm always looking at what the light's doing because that really is the thing that's gonna change the photo for me. And on this particular occasion, it was a really cloudy sunrise. It just looked like the light was gonna be super flat, but just on the horizon was a tiny clear band of sky. And as the sun rose up through that small band of sky, the uh, reflections on the water were amazing. And so I got myself at quite a high angle, pointed my 400 mil lens straight down at the water behind. And so those sparkles reflecting off the uh, waves were it turned into these nice, big, huge out of focus uh, balls of light, which I could frame the puffin against. And that really transformed the image from something very dull and flat to something a lot more memorable. So I really think wildlife photography can play an important role in uh, raising awareness for conservation. As a photographer, I get to go to some amazing places, see some amazing animals, but the average member of the public might not get that opportunity. And so they can't connect with the animal, a lion, for example. Whereas if I can take a photo of one and that photo is used in a conservation project and that's seen by the public, that's gonna help them connect to that subject and find out the story behind that subject that might be an endangered species. And if they can make that connection, we can help raise funds or that person may go on to uh, go and see the animal for themselves and get an even bigger connection and want to do more to help them. So visual storytelling is a really important aspect of being a wildlife photographer. Some advice for aspiring wildlife photographers is first of all, don't compare yourself to other people because that's a huge mistake to make. Everyone is on their own journey. You're gonna be better than someone. Someone's gonna be better than you. So comparing yourself to others is, is quite a slippery slope. And it's something I learned quite early on is just go at your own pace, do your own thing. And with time, you'll get better and you'll progress. But another bit of advice is to look at your photos. Say you go on a photo shoot and you take 500 pictures try and find the best five because they're gonna be in there somewhere. And so what you need to do is compare all those images together 
and you start really looking at the small details. There might be a distraction in the background of one that's not in the other. So you know the photo without the distraction is the better one. And when you start looking at those differences on the computer, you'll then start noticing them when you take the photos and you're out in the field. And so you're gonna instinctively start shooting fewer photos, but the ones you take will be better. Thanks very much for watching. If you'd like to know a bit more about me, head over to my website, richardpeters.co.uk. Maybe give me a follow on Instagram, at richardpetersphoto. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to MPB's YouTube channel.